Good morning and good evening, depending on where you're joining from today. Uh, welcome to Soul of Travel. I am really excited to be sitting down with Joanna Haugen, and she is the founder of Rooted. Um, and I have been so excited to have come across this company and your platform during my social media searches and then to connect and begin to kind of champion your efforts. So thank you so much for being here today. And I would like to give you a moment to just share a little bit about your background and um, how Rooted came to be. Well, thank you so much for having me, Christine. I know, um, you know, I appreciate and, and really love that you said that you love championing, uh, ch championing my work. That means a lot to me. I, um, and hi, hello, everybody who's joining us right now. I'm so thrilled to be calling in from Kiev, Ukraine, where I live. I am an American expatriate living overseas. And my journey to this place and to my brand Rooted um, started actually during monsoon season in a little tiny village in the Rift Valley of Kenya. Um, I served as a Peace Corps volunteer shortly out of college and um, like many folks um, during the time that I graduated, I couldn't find a job. And so I ended up um, working as a public health volunteer in Kenya. And on this particular day, I was trying to get to town. Um, a, our closest big city was called Fika. And it was middle of monsoon season. Finally, a matatu, which is the, uh, the public vans, um, showed up in our village. The road was dry enough for us to get out, supposedly, although it was awfully muddy to me. And as we were headed um, down this hilly road, um, down, we'd slide down one side, up the other side. And it was a really precarious journey on these dirt muddy roads um, and the matatu I was in got stuck in the mud and um, I remember thinking to myself okay I either have to walk several miles back in the mud this direction to the village or several miles that direction to the tarmac and neither option sounded very good to me um, and it just so happened that in the matatu were several young men and they didn't look at all concerned. They opened the door and got out of the vehicle and looked around at what we had in the, you know, this, this jungle kind of area that we lived in. It was very lush. And they broke off huge um, leaves from the banana trees. And they laid the leaves down in front of the wheels of the matatu and they kind of pushed from behind. They got the vehicle up onto these banana leaf wheels, uh, banana leaf. Um, banana tree leaves, and then they proceeded to kind of like um, jump leapfrog in front of each other, putting the leaves down, then running to the back and putting the leaves down, and the vehicle got unstuck. We started moving again. We reached the tarmac. We got to town, and um, to me, at the time, all I could think was, thank God I didn't have to walk back to the village uh, <laughs> in all this mud. But looking back at it, um, that was such a pivotal point in my career trajectory because it was a really important lesson to me that, that we create solutions based on necessity and the tools that we have around us. And we, humanity, are facing some huge challenges in the world today. And we really need to be looking at local communities and local people and the solutions and the creative ideas they have to address these problems on the local level. Because who better to solve the problems in our own communities and address our own needs than those people who are experiencing these things. Um, so that lesson in finding solutions and thinking about solutions from a local level really started my career in the travel industry, um, which then led um, into, um, I actually started by working in the timeshare industry, a timeshare company, most people don't know that, um, but that's where I started my communications work. And then I went to work for myself. I was a consumer facing travel writer. Um, so, you know, 
traveling all over the world, meeting great people, having fantastic experiences, uh, burned out after about five or six years. And then I started working in the communication side on, um, a, on the B2B side in the industry. And in that, uh, those positions as well, I was doing writing and communications. And here's the thing, here's, what, here's how I got where I am today. And that is that all these jobs that I had, I could see that there were incredible stories to be told, but the way that we're telling those stories and the language that we're using and the, um, the, the vehicles that we're using to tell those stories are incomplete. Sometimes we're actually doing damage when we tell the stories and use communication. And I really don't believe that travel writers and those working in the travel industry mean any damage. They don't want, to, they're not out to do damage. Um, but the travel industry has been at the root of a lot of ills in this world. Obviously um, it has a huge environmental, uh, negative environmental impact um, that we're trying to address now. It has, um, caused uh, cultural exploitation and, um, you know, caused a lot of social stratification. And so a uh, little over a year ago, I founded Rooted, which is a solutions platform at this intersection of sustainable tourism, storytelling, and social impact. And my goal through Rooted is to help those in the travel industry, like the uh, content creators and travel writers and the tour guides and those working in destinations learn how to responsibly use storytelling so that it is uplifting and empowering and amplifying these incredible um, stories around the world in a way that is responsible and mindful and ethical and is actually um, doing far more uh, good than harm in this world. Um, if we actually want tourism to be a force for good, this is one way that we can do that is through storytelling. And so, um, you know, it's a special solution space founded in this little tiny mud, uh, mud splattered uh, experience of mine in Kenya and a journey through the travel industry to, to get where I am today. Thank you so much for sharing that because, um, as I said, I've been following your work and uh, have loved seeing what you create, how you share it. Um, your perspective and lens on storytelling and these solutions. Um, but I think that moment that you shared uh, is really relatable. And I love that for a broader context for people just, uh, I think a lot of times and part of um, what solo travel about is about too is inspiring people to find their way on their journey. And we often think that it's really clear and we don't see like the truck and the banana leaves gets us to this brand that we've created. Um, and uh, so two things that are kind of funny about that, I totally re relate, resonate with the roads in Kenya. I think I thought I was going to die in Kenya many times on the roads and like driving and then all of a sudden being on a road that actually felt pretty good and then all of a sudden seeing vehicles just like divert from the road and being like out in the fields and going everywhere because all of a sudden the road just became nothingness and they would just like be like ants scurrying and then they would all come back together onto this road again. And then really being in the middle of nowhere and you had to have a truck um, speed bumps were like speed elephants. Like they were so huge. And then in the night in the little villages where they build their own speed humps um you don't know what's coming and we would be like looking and driving so slow hoping we wouldn't hit one and it would take out our vehicle so um i loved that story just because it reminded me of that experience and then also for me as i reflect on my journey soul of travel really started in this hut in uganda and it was really similar it was um sharing space with women and hearing their stories and seeing their resilience and seeing this uh, a 
very similar, like this ability to solve their problems from their space. And I think that we often, especially if we're lucky to travel, we interact with these communities. And if, um, and this is something we've talked about before, but if it doesn't seem like it lives up to what we believe might be this standard of ideal, we want to jump in and help. And really, if we just ask the community one, what they need and two for the solutions, it usually can just happen from that space organically without us needing to really jump in and, and do much of anything other than maybe provide resources or tools or support to something that might already be in motion. Um, so I really loved all of those, um, those aspects. And then for me, I love storytelling as this bridge because um, it, that's also really aligned with what I do. I, I think travel in itself is storytelling of the world. Like as we travel, we like, we unwrap the stories of the people and the land and the places and then internalize those and carry them with us. So um, I just love seeing how that all comes together and this alignment that we have in our hearts and the way that we show up in this space of travel and also kind of really get creative with um, travel. And I'll let you step in here in a moment, but I've been thinking a lot in my own business about when I first started, I actually kind of wanted to avoid the word travel. And it was really, I, I really wanted to connect people through each other's stories and shared experiences. And we happened to do it while traveling, but I didn't want people to just think of me as a travel company or a travel brand, but it was just really this tool for creating these relationships and experiences. But I wonder how um, that resonates with you. And um, travel really is this really valuable tool. And it's almost as if it becomes something other than travel in that context. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah well, and, and you know, two, two thoughts on that. Um, the first is that I think actually one of the, the stories that we tell in travel is that it is traveler focused. Um, you know, that's the, it's focused on the people who are taking the journey. And because that is one of tour, the tourism industry's story, that it is traveler focused, um, I would actually argue that we need to bust that myth because tourism and travel need to be happening under the expectation, based on the expectations and, um, and, and under the invitation, if you will, of the people who live in the destinations where people travel. There has been, um, especially prior to this pandemic, obviously, well, especially, you know, we are seeing this crazy acceleration of travel, this terminology of over tourism and people were just I mean, it was, it was, quite frankly, it was out of control. And, um, and local people were feeling the heat. They could no longer afford the places that they used to live. They couldn't go to their local, you know, favorite cafe because they couldn't afford it. They couldn't find a place to sit. Uh, neighborhoods were completely gentrified. Um, streets were clogged with travelers who didn't understand the, you know, protocol of, of a destination. And so I really believe that the travel experience, it, we, it shouldn't be traveler focused. It needs to be, communities and destinations need to be focused on the local people first. And then um, travel can and should be, the tourism industry can and should be woven within a community's fabric so that it adds value to the community as it exists. It, tourism and travel should not be dictating destinations. They should not be molding destinations so that they suit travelers. That is traveler focused. Um, it really needs to be focused on the locals and then the tourism model can fit in around that. And, you know, this comes back to something that I think about a lot in my work, and that is how does tourism fit into the sustainable development goals? And I think for far too long, we've been thinking about 
um, tourism and travel as working in a silo in conjunction to um, you know, whatever is happening in a place. And this is where it's running parallel to a community's needs and expectations. But if we can learn to weave tourism into a destination so that it's focused and dictated by locals and their needs, um, then we actually have an opportunity to enhance sustainable development goals. We have a way to support what communities are already doing. We have a way to amplify and elevate the work that locals are doing. We're not, we as the tourism ministry are not forcing that hand. We aren't dictating what it looks like. So, you know, it really resonates with me when you're, you know, you're talking about the, the hesitation to use the word travel. And I understand that because travel has kind of become a demonized word. A lot of communities don't want anything to do with tourists. Um, and I appreciate why that is. But if we can find a way to, to weave the travel experience into what already is so that it enhances destinations, I think there's a lot of power there. And quite frankly, it has been um, underappreciated and untapped. And, and, and we have a huge opportunity now to work with destinations and um, what their goals are to build back better and work within those goals to create a tourism ecosystem that works. Um, thank you for really, uh, I think that that can be a thought process that is, uh, comes up against a lot of resistance. One, because especially working in the tourism industry, we don't wanna hear um, that maybe it's not done well, right? Because it, it, it's uncomfortable. We, want, we don't wanna think of ourselves in that light. Um, and it, it is also sometimes hard to wrap our ha heads around why that is and what that looks like and what that feels like. And um, for me, it's also really hard to imagine. So I've kind of grown up in tourism, I say grown up, but in this bubble where I have been really lucky to be aligned with people who have always had um, like experiential, experiential travel, sustainable travel, responsible travel, like at the base and the core of their businesses. Mm -hmm. And so I've only ever seen that modeled for me. And so I forget often that there's this whole other side of tourism. And then I'll head to a, a traditional travel show and like I'm bombarded by this other realm and there's like one row for these like conscious travelers and everything else is something that um, I just don't understand because it's just not where my heart lies and I also know that makes up like 90% of the market and where travelers are getting their information and their inspiration and how they're experiencing the world and so there is a huge effort for this community to really amplify our voices. And so I think that's, again, um, so important, like you were saying, in, in how we show up and how we tell these stories and how we think about the way our words showcase destinations and the impact that that has, because there are so many people who are thinking from this space. And that was also part of soul of travel is that I'm really blessed to know these people doing great work. And when the pandemic started, I just was crushed for them because so many of them are small businesses. And I just started to think that we're not going to make it out of this. Like we don't have the capital. We don't have, um, you know, the means to endure this for the long term. And then I really saw that we are the people who can pivot, we can jump, like, that's what I had to do. Um, when I decided I could, I had to cancel all of my trips, I started this show to talk about what other people were doing to support their tour operators, their guides, the nonprofits that they're working with, um, they created video series and informational um, segments to still connect with their audience and to keep the, the, the beneficial aspects of tourism rolling. And so um, I, I really love this idea that 
we can use tourism as a tool for change and, um, and really tying into that shared connection. Um, I think you and I both agree that that's one of the most valuable pieces of, of travel or just getting people to one another um, is what it's about. And that um, also in terms of, for me, women, because I think it's so important that we see each other and we see each other as we are, where we're from, with the container that we come with, you know, um, and those uh, having those maybe challenging cultural conversations, which I've been so lucky to have. Um, and it breaks down, like you were saying, some of those those things that we carry with us and those beliefs that we have and our worldview. And I would love for you to share a little bit more about how you see travel working in that aspect and creating understanding around um, what it's like to be uh, who we are, where we are. And you're so lucky to have traveled so much and not just traveled, but lived. So you've actually gotten to experience being in a culture, which for me is my dream. Like I never want to go somewhere for two days or two weeks, like two months, two years. I want to have the opportunity to be amongst that community and really learn for me. That's what travel is about. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, you hit on it by saying that travel is a bridge. It, it, it is a tool uh, that we can use to help bridge our differences. And, you know, I think as we look around the world today, there's so much emphasis on our differences, political differences, racial issues. I, I mean, political, uh, actual political borders or geographical differences. And those are emphasized. And when we emphasize those things, we really, um, we tend to forget that at the base of everything in our deep, deep core, and not even that deep sometimes, we are all human. And even though we might have like different religious beliefs or political beliefs or whatever, I, I really believe that um, we share a lot of very common values. I think most people could agree that um, they just want a better future for their children. I think most people could agree that when they walk outside, they wanna feel safe. I, you know, and so we're talking about, you know, the, the what is that, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Mm -hmm. We all have basic needs. And I think we have an opportunity to bridge, uh, you know, to, to bridge those differences by finding that shared human connection. And I love what you said about having um, kind of those hard conversations, those hard cultural conversations, because I, I want to see more people in the travel context um, doing what I call complicating the narrative. And that is leaning into those things that are, are a bit more uncomfortable for us. And again, this is one of those myths with tourism that tourism and travel should be clean and comfortable and fun and you know it should be carefree and that's even the way we package it right this is part of our story part of tourism story is that it is a way to escape it's a way to get away um, and so what that means is when a lot of people travel they aren't having hard conversations because it's uncomfortable that is not escaping that is not getting away but I believe that in order for us to have truly meaningful um, connections with people and the places that we go to, we need to be willing to lean into those uncomfortable conversations. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, we just strike up conversation about political things and religious things. And, and there's all kinds of, you know, cultural protocol or whatever that we need to be thinking about. But like when I, I, I think a lot, I spent a, probably way more time than I should thinking about the climate emergency. I worry about it a lot. It keeps It literally keeps me awake at night. And um, I worry, for example, that when travelers travel to a lot of destinations, they don't think much about the climate emergency or what their negative environmental impact is on a destination. And a lot of tour operators aren't having those conversations with travelers. But there, again, there's an opportunity. We all want to have access to clean, safe water to drink. 
So how can we start having those conversations about water usage and water scarcity and what that means for the local community in a way that involves the traveler in a meaningful conversation so that they can connect that part of the story in their life with that part of the story in the destination where they are, they're at and the people who are there. What does that mean to them? What does water mean to them? How do they use it? What, what keeps them awake at night about the water? Um, and that's just one example, but I, I, I wanna see us using these shared challenges and these shared beliefs to have hard conversations because we can't keep running away from the world's challenges simply by taking a trip. That does not do anybody any good. In fact, it does more harm than, um, than good at all. So um, yeah, I think, I, I love what you say about these, these hard conversations and, and starting to use those as a way to, um, uh, quite frankly, turn passive travelers into more aware and engaged global citizens. That's where real change happens in this world. Hmm. Oh, I love that. I'm like, oh, I just want that to be like on my wall. That was really <laughs> beautiful how you worded that. Um, and I find myself saying that all the time. And it, it, it's, uh, it's really validating to hear that it's not just in my heart, actually, that there's other people that think that way. And um, going back to the example of um, getting travelers engaged and getting them thinking in a different way. Um, I actually use water as a tool as well, because it's something that we're going to be interacting with every day, right? And as a traveler, it's something you I think about like, where am I going to get clean water? I've definitely been really sick from drinking the wrong water. And so it's on top of mind. And um, so now I, um, encourage travelers to bring um, their like a self-contained water filter in a water bottle. Yeah. Yeah. And so then instead of just, you know, telling their travelers, this is a great product, you should bring it. Like, why? Well, we don't want to be, you know, purchasing water in the country in water bottles because of the plastic. Like that's a really easy conversation we can start to think about. And then well, one, why past that? What does it look like for that community when we come in and we're consuming the water that way and leaving that trash and how can they manage it? Because we have this mindset, which is not actually really accurate either, but that we take our water bottle and we throw it in recycling and it magically gets taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a whole nother conversation. But when you go to some of these communities, when you travel, for instance, um, well, I've been a lot of places where all of a sudden you see just, you know, the piles of trash yeah. and it will just be there forever. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't have a way to take care of it and they don't have the resources, especially when a large number of tourists, tourists start to inundate the area and bringing this additional trash with them. Um, and so it's a really relevant conversation. It's not hard. It's not abstract. This is the water yeah. you're going to be needing to drink mm -hmm. it let's just like think about it. And then I loved what you said of inviting anyone from the community in. Um, and again, you and I have had this, this privilege of seeing this happen, but when you're in Africa and you see people carrying water for hours mm -hmm. to bring it back to their families, um, like that has forever changed the way I use water. Every time I do dishes and I can fill up my sink full of clean water and I could even think about this water's kind of dirty, I would like to switch it over to cleaner water to clean my the rest of my dishes. I remember the day I spent with a friend and her her way of doing dishes was out on a table in the middle of the yard in a little bucket. And that water I'm telling you was not clean by our standards for the amount of dishes that went through it. And, um, it just, it really does change things. And then to be able to talk to her about like my experience washing dishes versus her experience. And it, it doesn't seem huge and yet it's so impactful. Um, so I love that that idea. And I also think that's something every tour operator could bring into their business without changing their platform, without getting, yeah. you know, too much into it. Your travelers are drinking water and the people where you're traveling are drinking water. It's yeah. such an easy point yeah. to connect on. 
And, and, you know, just to add on to that is one of the reasons why I'm such an advocate for using storytelling in um, intentional and mindful ways is that it doesn't cost us anything more. This isn't like a tool you need to buy. It's not something, you know, it's, it's not an extra cost. It's, it's a powerful resource that exists if we can learn how to use it in a thoughtful and responsible, uh, responsible and mindful way, and um, we're actually taking advantage of it. And I, that's the gap, right? That's the gap that we were talking about at the beginning is, you know, the, instead of just saying, oh, bring your own bottle, we don't want to use plastic uh, water or, you know, uh, plastic bottles, single use plastic bottles here, you know, learning how to use that story in an intentional way when we travel, we're going to say it anyway. So let's take the additional step and use it as a more um, meaningful learning opportunity. Now, all that said, none of this is like classroom science. You don't need to rehearse these things. And I, and I think that's part of the, the power of storytelling too. You just have to start learning to recognize these things in your daily operations. You know, where are the opportunities where you can Take advantage of, for example, the waiter who's serving you at dinner and, and he's serving you a pitcher of water. I mean, is there it just, it's just part of casual conversation. We, we are talking all the time. We are showing pictures. We are sharing graphs. We're doing all this form of communication within our tours with people who are all around us all day long on our trips. And so, you know, learning to you know, you know what people are going to ask. You know who you're going to encounter. Identifying the gaps, seeing the opportunities, and just like being aware of, oh, this is a great opportunity to take this conversation one step further. It doesn't need to be, you know, oh, oh, we're on page, you know, 87 of the script. This is what right. we say about water, you know, mm -hmm. and that's that's really, it can be subtle and it can be life-changing for a traveler if done in a really savvy strategic way. Um, what would you say to, and I've heard this point raised, is that people are, consumers and travelers are looking at travel often as a form of escape, right? Even if they are traveling, if they're to the point where they're seeking out more mindful <clears throat> or conscious experiences, or however you want to label that container, um, they still want to relax and they still want to have a vacation. And as someone providing that experience, you might feel hesitant to be then like bombarding them with this educational experience. And I, I think that's the resistance I hear from some people is that they don't want to take that like magic and that relaxation away. They do want to provide this educational opportunity. And, you know, for travelers like you and me all day long, we'd prefer that, like, just keep giving it to us because we want to learn and grow and absorb this culture in this way. Um, what would what would that balance be or how do we make that um, more appealing and i do think what you're saying it, it's the storytelling because then you're just telling a story and you take from it what you will exactly uh, and, and so i have i have two kind of two different responses to your question and the first one is um just being natural it's it's just about having a you know the conversation and and one of my favorite stories uh, about this um, has to do with a uh, tour guide that a uh, tour company that gives glacier walking um, excursions in Iceland. And as you know, people, they've signed up for this. They're not there for a climate lesson or whatever. That's not what they've signed up for. They've signed up to go walking on the glacier. But one of the things that is just part of this conversation while they're taking their photos or looking at this incredible um, uh, landscape in front of them is the tour guide, um, you know, he knows what they're going to be saying. He knows they're going to have a sense of awe. He knows they're going to be taking photos. And so he has a photo that he carries with him. And he says, well, actually, you know, this is what the glacier looked like when I was a child. And like, it's, re you know, like, and it used to be right here. And now it's way over there. Um, and, and inevitably, somebody's like, wow, like, you know, that's a big difference. He says, well, yeah, I mean, you know, this is a result of a warming world. And okay, like, but 
that is a lesson, but it's just a conversation. He's using his story of his childhood, um, talking about being on the glacier with his dad or his parents. We can all have stories in our own lives about um, you know, changing landscapes in our own lives too, like the little stream we used to go fishing in that, that is now polluted or no longer has fish or whatever. And so all he's doing is sharing this story about this is what it looked like when I was a kid and I was out here. People can like bridge that gap on their own. Um, they understand mm -hmm. what's going on there. And you know, so they're still having a good time. They're still there to escape. They're still in beautiful um, Iceland. But they're, you know, seeing, oh, this, this is just like 25 or 30 years ago. This is a, this is a big difference. You know, and another uh, great example is, for example, people who love to go snorkeling or scuba diving. Inevitably, you have somebody who says, what, what kind of fish is that? They want to know, what is that fish? And I had a marine biologist tell me once that he said, I would love to see more tour guides or, or dive instructors or whoever is leading those kinds of excursions say, oh, that fish is an XYZ. And then a lot of them stop, but what they should be saying is, oh, that's an XYZ. And it lives in um, this kind of habitat. And, and, and then just provide a little bit more information. Um, you're still enjoying your scuba driving trip. You are an engaged traveler. You're interested about in the landscape and in the, in the habitat. So it's just providing more context. Um, and you're still having a great time and nobody's stopping that, but you're actually getting more out of the experience. So, you know, in response to that question, I would say, I don't think anything's being taken away. You're just providing more story context to the experience. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, and then the second thing about uh, regarding how we can um, help people have these, these kinds of experiences without feeling like they're being burdened by today's heavy challenges is this is one of the reasons why I would like to see more tour operators partner with or collaborate with destinations to find social impact projects and initiatives in the destinations where they're working because there are um, incredible social impact projects all over the world that are um, addressing some of the world's most pressing issues, just like we were talking at the beginning of this conversation. And um, these are having these experiences and visiting these kinds of projects and initiatives are the opportunities where people really have that moment, you know, that moment. Um, so for example, there is a, um, a cafe in, um, I, I, I can't remember if it's in Nepal or, or India, I, I apologize for not remembering which of the two, but it's run, it's called She Rose, and it's run by a bunch of women who are acid attack survivors. This little cafe is a social impact project. It supports these women who are, have been outcast from society because they are um, acid attack survivors. And it's not a tourist destination. It's not for travelers. However, you know, if a tour company um, stops by and has a cup of tea or, you, you know, just incorporated in there in into the experience your travelers are learning about a cultural phenomena something that is very specific to the area they're meeting um women who have been empowered to address the issue and they're supporting this project uh financially and probably by posting about it on social media and things like that and for tour guides here maybe is you know the biggest like aha thing this is where the word of mouth um, marketing comes in. All you had to do was take your travelers to this place. And then when um, they go home and start talking about their experiences, this is going to be the thing they remember. It's not, you know, taking the photo in front of the Eiffel Tower. That's, you know, that's the ticket off the list thing. But this is the experience. This is the conversation they have. This is the moment they're going to remember. It's the story they're going to tell over and over again that then comes back as a reflection on your really awesome um, you know, experience that you've offered them. Again, you're not you know, throwing the experience like as a lesson at them. Mm -hmm. You are opening the door so they have an incredible experience and they will take from it what they want. Um, but by, by partnering and working and seeking out these kinds of experiences and then you know, 
being thoughtful and going that one step further, you create the conditions for incredible ripple effects of, of the power of travel. Um, I, I, that is, that is why I travel are those moments. And I love that you shared that experience. And, and that's why I really intentionally build those into what I create because those are the moments I've taken away and the, the moments that have been those it moments that mm -hmm. I will never let go of. And what I wanted to create was a company that intentionally put those into every experience. Um, yeah. because it is so powerful and, um, and it is, it is interesting to do it in a way that you are just offering this experience, like you said, and then the storytelling component does come very naturally. And then I also ask my travelers to share, like, that's a part of what you do as you take a sojourn with me is that your sojourn continues when you get home and mm -hmm. gather your community, share what what happened for you on this experience because they do then that inspires them to travel or maybe to consider doing something they wouldn't have done because they didn't see themselves as capable of having that type of experience like many people that would be really daunting to go to that cafe right and i wrote it down because i'm like oh my gosh i'm absolutely going to figure out where that is because that's the kind of experience i want to have but and then also some people don't even know this exists and they didn't know to seek this type of experience. So the yeah. more we tell these stories, which people resonate with more strongly than reading an itinerary or um, just like, I don't know, it's so, it, it's the human story. And so of course we want to be a part of it. Um, so I, I, I agree, like that's, so powerful and I, and I fully believe that that can be added to any type of trip even for a moment it doesn't have to be the whole trip but it's oh, no. like you said it's probably is going to be the thing that really sticks with them at the end of the day but if it feels like too much if you're someone who's creating experiences to just like you feel like you're laying too much in there just find one one thing that really is impactful and shares that story um I feel like we've only hit the tip of the iceberg for what I have wanted to discuss with you, which I knew would happen. Um, I really don't want to end this conversation without um, diving into the work that you do to help people understand how to tell this story. And, um, you know, the thing that comes up for me when I think about this, of how impactful these words are, and actually before I go there, this is totally unrelated and related. I started watching the morning show on Apple TV and it's about journalism and they show kind of like all these dark parts of it, but they really talk a lot about the words and the responses of the listener and how it shapes their perception and how the people who are creating those words are creating the reality. And so I think travel started, travel writing especially started as kind of this light profession. Actually it didn't. I had a guest on who talked about philosophers and early travelers and it actually was very scientific, right? But it has evolved into this like telling pretty stories, packaging this shiny package. Um, getting you excited about being out in the world in this very light way. Um, but we, we have the ability to shape how people are seeing the world and how they're going to step out into the world mm -hmm. and not be um, out there for their Instagram selfies, but to be a part of the community. So can you share... Um, what that looks like for you and especially for people who are like are interested in this who are peaked who haven't thought about how their words are impacting the way people are reading them and the story that they're actually telling um, what does that look like for for learning more and kind of taking that to the next level yeah so you know i mentioned that part of my journey was working as a commercial facing travel writer and I mentioned that I got burnt out. And one of the reasons for that is exactly like what you are saying. Travel writing, I think, has 
uh, incredible power that is not being recognized and not being um, fully appreciated. I also think that a lot of today's travel writing is actually quite destructive. And I say that because um, a lot of it is done based on desk research, um, press trips that are very curated. Um, they are done with kind of a, a, a um, predetermined lexicon of pretty words that we use. I mean, because like we have talked about, travel is sanitized and it's a way to get away and escape and all these things. And so travel writing reflects that. So there's kind of this um, circular model. We have travel media like publications that are running um, under um, uh, being being financed by um, destinations and stuff that have this picture of how they want to be portrayed. Travel writers are working to meet those needs um, and they don't want to complicate the narrative like we've talked about and editors don't want us to do that. Therefore, travel writers are using um, some very common article formats and common terminology that is actually not only um, harmful, especially to marginalized people or people who have been historically silenced, um, but they, it lacks historical and cultural context and it, um, and it, it looks harmless. It feels harmless because it looks pretty and it feels pretty. But the problem is that when readers get their hands on, you know, these 800 words that are paired with one headline and one photo, all the things that are not appearing on that page are the writer's um, inherent bias and perspective. Um, their financing models, like how they got to where they were going, um, how their privilege may have impacted who they were able to speak to and whether that person or those people felt safe speaking to them, um, where they were given access to and what that access looked like for them, um, what the information was that they were given about this place, how much um, background research they did to fully understand the historical and cultural context, um, what the layer of uh, colonization and historic oppression um, looks like, where they traveled and how that is, um, how that colored both what they choose, chose to write and how they wrote it. So there is so much extra stuff, all that baggage that we bring to the words that we use and the way that we use them, the imagery that we pair with those, the headlines we use, the, the way we tag things on social media. Um, and in everything that we say, there's so much more that goes unsaid. And it's all that stuff that is unsaid that your reader or your social media uh, media follower never knows about. And so they're making all their decisions um, on what is right in front of them. It impacts where they travel, how they travel, how they will act, um, their behaviors and um, actions once they've landed somewhere, their expectations. Um, I mean, we don't think much about the words we use, and yet they have so much influence, especially in travel-related writing, where the where the the um, the repercussions are so big. And I say that because there's a large financial investment when somebody decides to take a trip. So there's a huge financial like. Um, uh, baggage on top of an article, then you have the way that local people are going to be treated and uh, the way that people are going to understand the history and culture of a place, the way that people will um, treat the environment, um, both to their destination and while they're in a destination. And so all these things are tied into the way that we communicate and the stories we tell, um, you know, and, and 
And that's not just for travel writers, like commercial travel writers for magazines, but that's also, you know, in the industry, it's, it's what we write on our websites. It's what we put in our press releases. It's in the communication that we send to prospective travelers. It's what we put in our social media posts. We're telling stories all the time in the travel industry. And we need to be really, really mindful about um, what, our, how our history and our belief system and the global systems within which we work and our personal perspective and bias is shaped and, and how it is shaped, how we bring that to the work we do. We cannot, um, you know, just, I, I, I can't write off the fact that I am a white woman of privilege but what I can do is bring that with me to my work and be aware of it every time I sit down to write and communicate. Um, and, and I can't write myself out of my story and I don't wanna write myself out of my story, but I need to be aware of how my story impacts the story I am sharing with other people. And that is, um, that's really where we need to be thoughtful about the word choice we use, the imagery we're choosing, um, how the words and those images, when they're combined, how are they actually going to be read? Because the influence they have is phenomenal. Um, I just want to really reiterate the awareness component of that because someone who might be listening, um, especially if you um, aren't a seasoned traveler or depending on where you're at in your journey, um, that was a lot, right? That's a lot. It's a lot to consider. <laughs> no, it's Sorry. beautiful. I love it. I, I, I think it's so important. But what that does, and it's similar conversations when you look at, you know, you know, greening your business or creating more sustainable ventures, like all of these things, it's, it's a lot. And we really want, the more you understand, the more you realize that it's not easy. Like there's all these rippled effects that happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it comes to first the awareness that this is true. And from that awareness, you're just going to act differently. And you might not know how to bring all of these components into your business and implement them. And you're not going to make all the right choices every mm -hmm. single time. But if you have that awareness and that intention, you're going to be moving forward from a different space that is going to have a different effect. And so I just don't want anyone to be discouraged by all of those components and think that they can't even begin to manage to, to do that because they can. And, and just listening to this and just internalizing it for a moment will actually create a shift for them, whether they realize it or not. And so I don't, I don't want that to be lost on anyone that, that they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, because yeah. it is, it's a lot. And I think about it all the time because I am very aware of it. And um, I constantly will read something and then like put on a different hat and be like, oh, that's not what I meant. Um, or, you know, that wasn't how I wanted to tell that story. I wasn't thinking about this component. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it is difficult, but it's also really beautiful because it, it, it's getting you to think in all these different ways, which for me is one of my favorite things to be able to do. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I would say too, you know, just as we are providing the way and the means for our travelers to have a journey, our journey through the tourism profession, I mean, that's a journey too. We're always learning, we're unlearning, we're relearning, we're, you know, tweaking our tours, we're, we're changing the way that we're promoting things. It's all a learning curve. Um, you know, these are just, it's just some, like you said, it's just something else to be aware of. You know, it's, it's, it, it does matter. Um, but it's a journey. And so I would say, you know, be aware of it and, and also have fun on that journey while you learn to, to use storytelling in a more powerful and meaningful way in your work because you have the power to tell stories. You've been telling stories your whole life. Your, your world is filled with stories. Now it's just a matter of learning how to tap into them in a way that really accelerates your business in a, in a more meaningful and um, powerful way. Yeah. 
um, yeah, thank you. I love that too, because uh, it's been so interesting to see like this rise of storytelling marketing and, and, you know, branding with your story and as if stories just arrived. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's really the only way we know how to be in the world. Like it's the yeah. only, the only thing that has ever happened consistently is yeah. that we've been immersed in stories. Um, and so it's really the most natural thing. And so I, and the most powerful. So I really appreciate um, your perspective on how this can be uh, really utilized in travel. And like you said, bridging that gap and being that kind of that missing tool that we can use in so many different ways. Um, I really have no desire to wrap up this conversation at all. Um, so hopefully we can come back and maybe dive into some of these other points that I had on my list that I really wanted to talk about. Um, but in the sake of time, we'll probably wrap up here. Um, I am going to bring in my fun little rapid fire that I need to rename because they're never rapid fire questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> but just give uh, a little bit of a lightness at the end of our conversation and also let people get to know you as a traveler and then also just inspire them through some of these questions. So okay. um, there's seven. And the first one is, what is your favorite book or movie that offers you an escape or an inspires you to adventure? Um, oh gosh, I am a voracious reader. And so that's a, that's a tough one for me, but what I want, I'll, I'll just share one book that I read last year that I think, um, really fired me up. It was called Humankind and, um, it was by a Scandinavian gentleman. I can't remember his name, but it really reinforced this idea. Uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in optimism and hope. Um, in our world. And so all this book, Humankind, it, it was just released last year. Um, that's the one that really fires me up when I think about getting back on the road again. Um, what is always in your suitcase or your backpack? Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I always, I always bring like my own tote bag and, and, uh, and my own water bottles. I mean, that's not really exciting, but it's true. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I don't pack heavily. So um, <laughs> yeah, just, sm just small reusable things. Oh, yeah. and I, I actually, that's it. I have a wonderful little tiny pair of travel slippers I bought in Stockholm a couple years ago. I don't leave home without those either. <laughs> Those are valuable things though. Those are learned things to bring. I always have yep. those two things as well. Um, and airplane socks, which my kids think oh, yeah. are crazy, but I always have yeah, airplane that's, socks. That, that's, I use my little slippers for that, <laughs> for that too, yeah. Um, what is your favorite destination? Um, I took a trip to the Cook Islands uh, several years ago and that was a place I will never, uh, never forget it was spectacular it's it, it you know it's one of those places that i kind of don't want to go back to because i don't want to tarnish the memory of that trip so i probably won't ever go back with intention i won't go back yeah um where do you still long to visit uh where do i long to visit i've always wanted to go to new zealand i um i'm uh I'm a long distance hiker and I love outdoor activities. So I've, I would love to, to go to New Zealand. Although I don't think I would ever go absorbing. Is that what it's called where you get in this big ball? In the big ball and roll down the mountain. Yeah, so that's yeah. not really my, um, that's not my cup of tea, but I'd go hiking. In New yeah, Zealand. that sounds terrifying. I would like my feet yeah. on the ground. And I have a book <laughs> recommendation that I'm going to send to you in the context of New Zealand that I think you would like. Um, let's see. What do you eat that immediately connects you to a place you've been oh chapati mm -hmm. um from kenya uh, we lived with a family for two months while we were there um before we moved out on our own and uh the smell of chapati um yeah um who was the person that inspired or encouraged you to set out and explore the world my dad i uh, yeah, I used to travel with my dad um, on business trips, like day long business trips before I was three and you could travel for free and there was like no big security or whatever. Uh, 
So my dad from a very young age, and he also um, took us on summer vacations around the United States. And uh, that's where I learned my love for the outdoors and, and, and just traveling in general. Um, and the last one is, if you could take an adventure with one person, fictional or real, past or alive, who would it be? Um, I mean, it's going to be a boring one, I suppose, but I would say I, I, I love to travel with my husband. It's just, he's my favorite travel partner. We're very compatible together when we travel. And so um, I know I have this whole big um, option, you know, all these options, but honestly, I, I just, I know it's always going to be a good trip when he's by my side. Excellent. Well, you couldn't ask for more than that. So, yeah, yeah. Um, well, again, uh, thank you so much. Like I said, there's so much more. Um, anybody who's listening, I really, really encourage you to check out Rooted Storytelling, to find Joanna on LinkedIn. Um, I have learned so much just for being in the periphery and following um, your social media and have been inspired. And, and it's really just meant something to me to be a part of that conversation, even from the outside. And um, one day I really hope to be able to take your writing program so that I can just learn more and enhance how I show up in that space. So thank you for being here today and sharing the work that you do. Thank you so much, Christine. Your words are so kind. I, I am, uh, you know, so privileged to, to know you as well. So thank you for having me on, on your program. And um, thank you for, um, you know, all these amazing conversations that we've had so far. I know we have lots more to have. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, and I will share all of the ways people can reach with you in the show notes. That'd so we'll have that as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.